The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the AIC's Are You Ready to Collaborate webinar. My name is Sam Perkins and I'll be the presenter for today's session. First off, let me thank the Department of Science, Information Technology and Innovation who sponsor this webinar series and several of our other programs and we deliver it on their behalf. Just a little bit about the AIC. We're set up to work with industry research organisations and government agencies with a focus on creating jobs and wealth by taking innovative ideas to market. The AIC is a not-for-profit and our areas of expertise are in innovation, commercialisation and collaboration. And on behalf of the Queensland Government, we deliver a number of programs such as the Queensland Inventor Service, which is designed to help startups and entrepreneurs, Ideas to Market, which is a practical workshop on taking your idea and turning it into a marketable product or service, and workshops on business model innovation, and Innovation Clinics, which are our focused approach to solving an industry problem. Today's objectives are for you to learn about the importance of collaboration and the benefits it can bring to your company, about the different types of collaborations, and I'll have some local and international best practice examples, and what you need to do to become collaboration ready in your business. What is collaboration? Well, there's a couple of definitions. Let's focus on this one to begin with where the key idea is on producing something new or differently to create value. And you do it by building on each other's expertise. Note the word communicating and working together because that's the key of collaboration. Another definition, again, mutual benefit, including the sharing of some technical and commercial risk. Now these two reports, the Deloitte Access Economics Report on the Collaborative Economy and the Australian Innovation System Report are an interesting read. So look at them online if you're interested in knowing further. Now here is a key and it's a key for Australia because we are a small country in a global economy. The challenge is how to learn how to manage these partnerships and that's what we'll be focusing on today. So in our country, who is most likely to collaborate? Well, according to ABS data, small to medium-sized enterprises that focus on export are three times more likely to collaborate than firms that are only looking locally. And large exporters are more likely to collaborate than smaller firms that don't export. So those that are focusing on the export market, which is an area perhaps they are not familiar with, in these markets are most likely to take advantage of collaboration. And why would they do it? It's a very interesting statistic that companies that collaborate are twice as likely to be profitable and to outgrow their competitors. And here's some interesting stats for you. The improvement in productivity from companies that both innovate and collaborate. Now for those of you who'd like to dig into these facts and figures in more detail, this webinar will be uploaded onto our website, our QMI Solutions YouTube website, and you can look at it in more deal, detail later. So what do we mean by collaboration? Well, collaboration occurs on a continuum from an informal opportunity where you meet someone at a networking event through to coordinating activities, cooperating with them on other things, and then collaboration. When we talk about collaboration, we're talking about a structured approach where there are distinct goals and you're working together to achieve those. So why would businesses want to collaborate? Well, we've identified four major factors. These days, technological changes are really making a difference. The rapid pace of change, for example, online retailing is forcing companies to look at that. 
And also current technology is changing very quickly and people having trouble keeping up with their competitors. Also changes in technology and collaboration with other partners can increase the efficiency of your business. Some collaboration is driven by regulatory changes where people must comply. A lot of it is driven by scalability issues, being able to scale up your business. And the simple fact is, market factors, you are dealing with a more sophisticated customer and even though we're in Australia, it is a global economy and a lot of businesses face competition from cheaper imports. Internally, what drives companies to consider collaboration? Usually because they lack the knowledge or skills or resources to grasp an opportunity that they can see. It may be simply to reduce the risks and costs of developing new products, particularly in large infrastructure projects, or in the case of exporters, they may want to collaborate in order to access new markets where they don't have marketing expertise. Now the point of collaboration is to deliver a competitive advantage for you and your collaborative partners that those businesses that don't collaborate can't achieve. And you do so, you may share information and knowledge, you may share resources such as particular equipment that one business may have, but it's all around business benefits. So what types of collaborative relationships are there? Generally, we divide them into four areas. Collaborations within and along a supply chain, which is where the majority of Australian businesses collaborate. Collaborate in a sector with your competitors. Collaboration based on a geographical or regional area. And collaboration across sectors. And I'll give examples of each of these in the next few slides. What do I mean by supply chain collaboration? I'm going to give two international examples that are best in class. The first one, Bright Farms, is a company that finances, builds and operates hydroponic greenhouses on or near the rooftop of supermarkets. The method is based on a business model that's been successful in solar panels and the renewable energy industry. And the idea is to solve the supply chain problem of food being transported a long way. Now this is pretty similar, this is a US case, but we have a similar situation in Australia where food has travelled for thousands of kilometres in many cases from the farm to the store. Now Bright Farms works on a model and they focused on a particular part of the food industry, in their case lettuce. In the US it takes about a week for all supermarket lettuce to get to the big cities from the various places where it's grown. And this is a waste of resources in terms of the cost of transport, the fuels and the growers and the time, etc, etc. They reckon that half the cost of a box of lettuce at the wholesale price isn't actually due to the food, it's due to the transport costs. So Bright Farms collaborates with the supermarkets to build and operate these greenhouses on their rooftop premises. It's innovation and greenhouse farming on a commercial scale. It's unique in the first in food industry and it works for them because they, the supermarkets and bright farms agree long-term purchase agreements that keep costs fixed and volume set and essentially the supermarkets are guaranteeing the revenue before bright farms build them. Another good example, relevant again to us here in Australia, is K-Stack. K-Stack looked at the situation and saw an opportunity where many trucks that are partly full are turning up at a retail premises. That's a waste of, of effort and energy to get there and it more so makes it expensive for the supplier who has to pay high costs for it. Now K-Stack produces software and collaborated with the retailers and the suppliers to essentially ensure that any truck turning up at the retail place is full rather than empty. So they dealt with a situation of less than truckload turning up. So for example, one particular retail place dealt with 20 trucks in the morning, none of which were full. 
by collaborating with KSTUC and their suppliers, they now only receive six trucks that are full. So KSTAC works by matching up the supplier's weekly purchase orders that are all destined for the same retailer and ensuring via their warehousing that the truck turns up fully loaded when it gets there. Essentially it's a retailer consolidation program and it's a way for small to medium sized enterprises to achieve that critical mass in transportation that enables them to reduce costs on their end. If you'd like to know more about KSTAC and Bright Farms, please just look them up online. They're a good example. The other type of competition, of course, business to business within a sector with your competitors. Now, this is a bit of an issue for us in Australia, where we tend not to focus and consider the option of actually competing and collaborating at the same time. Now, if I give an example of what I mean by this, you can see the two images on the screen. Favco Queensland was created by the two biggest Brisbane fresh food vegetables companies who run the farms, who run Brisbane food markets. Now, these companies continue to compete on their everyday sales, but what they decided was to establish a joint venture to investigate and carry out research and development looking for new varieties of fruit and other value-added products. So these two companies continued to compete on the ordinary sales, but together collaborated by establishing a JV to take advantage of new things and develop new things for their combined markets. The picture on the right of avocados refers to the New Zealand avocado industry, who a similar model, they collaborate to grasp their export opportunity but they compete on their domestic market. This is a good opportunity and examples for us here in Australia, where for any one business, we are too small to be noticed on the global market. But if we collaborate and, for example, do joint marketing and joint export negotiation, etc., we have an opportunity to really establish a worldwide presence and exports. The other type of example I'd talk to, like to talk to you today is collaboration based on a geographic region. For example, we're all aware that the Barossa Valley is marketed as a place to go for food and wine, etc. It's a good example of a collaboration between all the food producers, the vineyards, the tourism association and the local economic development agencies who all together collaborated to produce joint marking, marketing and an image that is attractive to the tourism industry and brings people in. The other type of collaboration is across industry sectors. Geelong Food Groups is an interesting example of this. Now the Geelong Food Products Cluster is a group of similar minded companies and their suppliers and their customers who work in the Geelong region and have been working together under collaboration for mutual benefit since about 2005. Now the Geelong area has strengths in seafood, in dairy, in meat and in poultry and that makes up about 60% of the economy of that area. In this food cluster, each business has its own traditional food range, but they work together across and within a supply chain to develop co-products. Now, a lot of these co-products focus on adding value, for example, to low value or surplus products. So, for example, low value fish species from the seafood company, fish bycatch, lower value meat cuts and meat trim. And by collaborating and using hot better value added processing and new recipes and new applications, they've created new products to sell. For example, Astremi Seafood's new fish in source chilled meat packs for retail was a collaboration between several companies. By focusing on this with all the different expertise in this group, they've been able to also look at extending shelf life or packaging improvements and out of this have come other projects, such as the Australian Quality Farm Rabbit's new rabbit barbecue and casserole packs. So as acting as a regional group and across the industry sectors, these businesses have been able to create new products and extend their range and market while still keeping 
their original product range and businesses going very well. Now, a collaboration that I particularly like, because it's a Queensland one, is the one between Australian Crocodile Traders, which is a crocodile farm in Cairns, and the Mulgrave Mill, which is a sugar mill just south of Cairns. Now, the mill has a situation where it is using a lot of hot water during the processing season, and because of that, and it, the water is coming out boiling, they actually have to cool the water before they can discharge it back into the river. Nine kilometres down the road is the Australian Crocodile Farm. And this is the largest saltwater crocodile farm in the world. And this gentleman sells his crocodile skin and food. The meat goes to various places. Parts go to China for medicinal purposes. And the skins go to the luxury handbag manufacturers. Now there's a bit of a problem where this farm is a little bit too far south to grow the crocodiles all year round but it's situated in the location for easy access to the airport for exports. But the trouble is it's a few degrees too cold because crocodiles require an all-round temperature of 38 degrees. So the person who runs this farm was having to heat the water to keep his crop growing and of course that's a very expensive option. And one day when he was coming back in his light aircraft he saw steam coming out of the sugar mill and realised there was an opportunity to work together here. So he went up and spoke to the mill operators and they agreed a collaborative deal for the crocodile trader to buy the mill's hot water and have it pumped out to his farm. Now of course it wasn't quite as easy as that. He had to then go and get talk to all of the intervening properties between the mill and the farm and get approval to put in a pipeline but it was a success and he is now buying he now receives around two megalitres of water a day in the cool season to keep his crocs warm. And instead of having four months of the year when the crocs aren't growing, he now has all-round productivity. Now this collaboration has been a benefit for all the partners because not only is a crocodile farm not having to ex extract and heat water, so it's been able to cut its energy use, the mill is profiting from selling 2% of its hot water to the farm and also, the local abattoir now, sends 30 now sells 30% more feed to the crocodile farm because the crocs are eating and growing all year round. So this is an example of a collaboration that's good for the environment and it's been good for the development of industry in that area. So if you're interested in collaboration, why would you want to collaborate? It's because the problem isn't routine, it's out of your experience, and you can't, receive, you can't achieve the result on your own. But also, the real reasons to collaborate are to focus on delivering benefits to your customers. You may want to cut costs or increase your revenue, and you may want to add value to your business. When you're looking at a collaborative opportunity, it must be aligned with your business objectives and your business strategy, and you must prepare and become ready to collaborate if it's going to be successful. But remember, a collaboration is a partnership. It's not a purchase order. If you choose to collaborate, it may change your existing relationships and you need to think about how that will work. It's very time consuming. It may or may not be successful. But the purpose of today is to give you that training and step you through the process to increase the chances of a successful collaboration for you and your partners. Collaboration does have legal issues and paperwork around it. It could change your business and how you structure it. Even when you have a collaborative process underway, a project in particular area, you still have to focus on running your existing business. And collaboration requires a leader, a champion to drive it through. So do you have the time and resources required? So you're interested? you think you have an opportunity, how do you go about doing it? And that's what I'll address next. First off, stop and take a good hard look at the situation. Do you actually need to collaborate? As I said earlier, it takes time, effort and money. So here is a list of checklists you can go through to see if it's the right thing to do for you in your situation. If you can solve the problem yourself or buy it outright for another company, you don't need to collaborate. 
If somebody else in your sector has a similar problem, that is an opportunity to collaborate and come up with potential solutions. If this is a problem that requires some serious investigation, then it's worth considering collaborating not only business to business, but perhaps with a research organisation who has the skills and technology to look at the fundamentals of the problem and come up with potential solutions. And if this is a problem that is industry-wide, then it is worth getting together and bringing this to the attention of the government and the industry associations and other bodies to establish a proper research program and look into the issue in quite a bit of detail. So perhaps you've decided that you do want to collaborate and the issue is one that you can solve and bring, get together with other businesses. So I'm going to step you through the next couple of processes. How to become ready, the key questions you need to address for yourself and your business. And then a checklist of the sorts of things that you need to do and address in order to be successful. The key questions. What do you need? and what are you hoping to get out of the collaboration? Can you spare the effort and resources involved? And question number four is important. We're talking about a collaboration, which is a partnership, and you have to think about how much you are willing to give up to form that partnership. You need to look at whether your company's culture will support a collaborative approach, and if things need to be changed, what you can do, and you need to sit down and think from the other person's perspective what value you are bringing to the collaboration that they would see. So I'll step you through the checklist. The needs, the goals, capacity, communication, which is the essence of any collaboration, and the written agreement. First and foremost, you must be clear about what your goals for the collaboration are. Are you trying to access new people, new equipment, funding from a different company that may bring that in order to meet new demands for the customer or grasp an opportunity you can see? Is a purpose that you want to achieve is to upskill your current employees? Is it simply to decrease your cost to market or to develop new distribution channels, for example, if you're looking at exporting? Or is it to share the risk of developing new products and services? Be clear about what you want. And then look at your capacity. Who needs to be involved when? Who can be left out until plans are developed and it reaches this area? Do you actually have the human resources required to work on and manage this process? And how will you do it? It's important that the right people are involved in the collaboration at the right time not simply somebody who happens to be free at the time. And you must stop and think about potential barriers. What are the things that are, could hinder you collaborating? And what can you do to address and deal with these issues? So stepping you through the process, and I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail, First off, you've got to identify potential partners. Then you have to evaluate each of them and choose the most appropriate one or ones. You should negotiate the commercial terms of the agreement, so the requirements, obligations, and communication and decision making is clear to all partners. You must review the collaboration regularly. The point of this is to deliver a competitive advantage for your business and your collaboration partners. And you should start planning with the end in mind. When the collaboration is a success, how will it be wound down? Or if it want, you want to continue it, how will you set new goals? So let's start with partners. Who could be potential collaboration partners for your business? And what are the factors that would interest them in collaborating with you? So consider as many options as possible. People you might already know, a lot of Australian companies that collaborate, as I mentioned earlier, in the export SME group, are often collaborating with customers or with their suppliers. 
So talk to those people first and see if there's an opportunity there to work with them. Hunt around and find businesses that complement yours, that bring different skills and experience and distribution channels and see if there's an opportunity there. You might find a lot of these people attending industry shows, networking events. You can always look online, chat to your local chamber of commerce, your local industry association. And don't forget to talk to the regional state government office contacts in your area because they often know what's going on and have useful information and contacts. Once you've identified a group of potential partners, you need to select them and evaluate them. The most important thing is, do you think you have clear shared goals? Do you know what you are bringing to the table in terms of collaboration and can you say what you want them to bring? And most importantly, do you and your potential collaboration partner see your respective inputs and outputs as fair? At the end of the day, a collaboration is a business arrangement but it's about people. Perception, communication and trust are key. Now when you're evaluating potential partners, have a good look at their other organisation. What is their culture like? What is their governance like? What is the structure of their organisation? What are their decision making processes? Because they may be different to your decision making processes and you'll have to work these out through the relationship and come to an agreed method. What are their policies? For example, their occupational health and safety policies may differ from yours and this might be important in your industry. What are their financial resources, their assets and their funding? Now there's no expectation that there will be exact matches and there may be some areas of incompatibility. So the point of investigating this and communicating and discussing it with a potential partner is to see how you can overcome those areas of incompatibility. But the most important part is to first build the relationship. Regular face-to-face -face meetings are important and to communicate and discuss all of the factors that I have listed there. Because what you are focusing on is getting to understand your, ver your partners helping them to understand you with the goal of building trust. If you sit across the table from the person opposite you and you do not feel that you can trust them, do not proceed with that collaborative opportunity because it is much harder to unwind a partnership than it is to walk away, thank the person for their time and go and look for another potential partner who is more complimentary to your business. Now here is a list of collaboration success factors and I remind you from the definition at the beginning where they were talking about working with businesses to gain a collaborative, as a collaborative opportunity to gain a competitive advantage. The purpose of collaboration is to strategically work together to gain an advantage that neither company could do by themselves. There must be a common goal each member may have other individual goals, but you must both be striving for the same thing, such as entrance into a particular export market or to be able to tender for a particular work package in a big infrastructure project. All members on that collaboration must share risks, rewards and responsibilities. Otherwise, it is highly likely that one particular group does not feel that their contribution is fair or they're not being treated fairly, and that is more likely to derail a collaboration than missing a technical milestone. The reason you're entering into collaboration is to deliver real benefits for your business and your partner's businesses and that is the focus more than anyone could do on their own. So I will repeat it again but the essentials for collaborative success are all those soft person-to-person -person skills having an effective leader that the group respects, ongoing communication between all the parties. The people who are the team members who are part of the collaboration must be willing to participate. Don't just coerce somebody there because it's convenient. They have to want to be there to participate. And the point of being part of that collaborative team is to bring new ideas, create them and consider them as products and services. Teamwork and trust, 
again, I remind you that you need a goal to go for and a plan to get there. It's best that the collaborative team has a diverse set of skills and experiences. They do need to build up mutual respect. And I'm going to now focus on the written agreement is key. And that is because it's often the case where you think you've agreed something, but it's not until it's in writing that each party can check that they perceive the situation the same. So coming back again to what collaboration is, and you can see looking at this slide that it varies from an informal to a formal relationship, and it can vary from simple to complex. So if you're just sharing information with another company at a networking event, for example, you probably don't need to look at a formal agreement. If you're sharing personnel, sharing staff, sharing know-how, expertise built up in your business, then you probably want to consider at least a confidentiality type agreement. If you're actually sharing resources such as equipment, customer databases, etc., etc., you would at least want a memorandum of understanding between the parties. And if you're going to co-develop products and services, then you might require something as formal as a joint venture agreement. So focusing on agreement, here is an image that we use that ticks off the major things you need to consider. And I'll step through each of these quickly. Milestones. Agree and record them and make sure that costs and payments are linked to milestone achievement. And as a point I said earlier, agree how benefits will be shared and how the collaboration will be wound up. Agree who will pay for what costs and with what. And don't forget it's not all just cash. It's also in-kind, contribution of equipment, facilities, staff time. If there's any external source of funding involved, who will organise that? Who will benefit? Any background intellectual property that is propriety to any of the one partners, if that's been contributed. And in fact, any other significant contributions should be recorded and agreed between the parties. It's very important to agree the tasks and responsibilities, getting the right people involved. You will need somebody who drives the collaboration and you should meet regularly and monitor the progress of the collaboration. It's often said that the more planning and discussion of all these things you do up front, the better the project will run. Inevitably, there may be technical difficulties and if, for example, communication and decision making is clear, then it makes the process much smoother. For example, if there is a major incident, it may be agreed that all of the CEOs of that collaborative group will each be will have arranged and met each other either in person or by teleconference within 36 hours for any one of them being notified of the major incident. Intellectual property is often an area that can cause some confusion and debate. Decide who owns which IP, if there's new intellectual property being developed as part of the project. Who owns it, which is separate from who has the rights to use it and for what purpose. If it's something that can be registered in terms of IP, so a new patent application or a trademark, who will pay for it to be protected. And the thing that is often forgotten, if it's important, this, intellectual, this new intellectual property, if it's challenged, under a court by another company, who's going to pay and how will that issue be dealt with amongst the parties?
Okay, sorry for that. My, my uh, computer tells me that audio is now back on and it seems I merely knocked the connection as it goes into the computer. So I apologise for that loss. And thank you for everybody on the chat for letting us know that was the case. Now we're coming to the end of the seminar and I will just wind up and then ask for people to send in their questions via chat. As you can see from the slide and as I said at the beginning, agree and record how benefits will be shared if the collaboration is successful and plan with the end in mind. Think about and agree how the collaborative partnership will be wound up when the goals have been met. Also consider how you would deal with the situation if one particular partner wishes to withdraw th from the collaboration during the project. Now moving on, I'll quickly cover off a little more detail about those types of commercialisation arrangements I referred to in the slide earlier where I showed the continuum of types of collaborations. So an MOU is a type of agreement that describes what each party will do and essentially it says it will cooperate in good faith. It is not a legally binding agreement. A deed, however, is a binding agreement and it's often signed as signed, sealed and delivered or executed as a deed. The difference between a deed and a contract is a deed doesn't require any consideration. And by consideration, I mean a financial pay payment from one party to another. The other major types of commercial agreements could be, for example, between the collaborative partners, a heads of agreement, which just describes what they intend to do at some point in the future, but also says, when they will actually enter into a binding contract. Okay. Not yeah. All right. That time I didn't knock it, so we don't know what's wrong. We'll look at this after. We'll investigate this in more detail after the webinar is finished. So you can see the different types of agreement. Now, just to finalise, be aware collaboration brings many benefits, but just be aware of these risks. The partners may not honour the spirit of the relationship, so that's why I said it earlier on. You must trust each other if you do not feel that any areas of incompatibility can be overcome. It's better to walk away and look for another opportunity. And if all partners don't fully participate, particularly if some of them don't feel the previous page again please. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, we're getting chat to say go from the previous page again. So I'll just go back one page, which will require me to check back through. Types of commercial agreements. So I'm covering off four different types of commercial agreements, becoming more formal as you go along and as your collaborative venture becomes more formal. Just give you a moment to read those. Okay. Okay, I shall move back on to the last slide. Be aware of potential risks. Now, since collaboration takes time and effort and resources, the project must be worthwhile. 
One of the risks of collaboration is you may lose control of your intellectual property. Now this is why we say uh, making sure that you have a written agreement that discusses as many things that are important to you and your business and your collaborative partners and have them down in writing and agreed. It does not have to be as formal as a written contract. If that is not necessary, it could be as simple as an MOU, but it is worth and checking and communicating with the other partner about all the different issues. Now the other risk is if the collaboration is an abject failure, there are risks to your business and your partner's businesses with their reputation. And lastly, but most importantly, and more likely than any of the ones above, is the risk around the fact that the partners and their staff collaborating may not actually have skills in that area. And this is one of the reasons why the Department of Science, IT and Innovation fund us to run these sorts of webinars to help lift the level of collaboration skills to people and also to run workshops on these sorts of things. So that's the end of today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. For those who are interested, there will be other webinars that we'll be running over the, for the next six weeks. And one of them will actually focus on collaboration from the perspective of a research organisation. So for any of those of you who are interested in learning how to collaborate with a university or some other research organisation, please sign on and listen to our webinar on that next time. Now I am going to have a look at some of the questions that have been asked by the chat line and address them to you as much as I can. Now Christine has asked, would much of this, could it apply to angel investment? Well, an investment isn't really a collaboration. It's almost a purchase of part of your business for a sum of money. But the essentials of understanding your goals, what you are seeking, what you are seeking from the other person, in this case the angel investor, and being clear about how the benefits will be shared and how the exit will occur is just as important in talking to and dealing with a business angel investor as it is with another business you are seeking to collaborate. Uh, now Mark has asked me, do you have any specific comments on collaboration with the Cooperative Research Centre, which is a funded research centre involving partnerships of universities and businesses? Yes, I would. Now around the CRC, there are particular issues around IP, intellectual property, and partners' ability to use that and that is specific to the CRC. But the essentials, and the CRC often has a very, very large and formal agreement attached to it. 